Uh, for, well, for those of you uh, who are left, I think you're in for a real treat. Our final speaker is uh, Dr. Ken Blick. And so, Ken, I think this is his first trip to the American Society of Preventive Cardiology, right? This is the first, first one. He just came down from the American Association of Clinical Chemistry. So Ken is actually, he, he is a laboratory director and has some unique perspectives. One of the few times we get to learn directly from the laboratory director regarding these assays, all these tests that we send, and the nuances there. He's um, professor of medicine and the director of laboratory medicine at the Oklahoma Health Science Center in Oklahoma City. Um, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from, uh, in, in chemistry and mathematics from the University of Western Kentucky, and then went on to get his PhD in organic chemistry and spectroscopy. Um, from the University of Kentucky and did a postdoctoral fellowship there. Then Oklahoma was uh, lucky enough to recruit him. He's had a long-standing career there, over 30 years at the University of Oklahoma. He's brought in many new tests, and that laboratory has really grown into an incredible institution. It processes over 7 million lab tests per year. Uh, Ken was responsible for bringing in the very first CRP test, the very first homocysteine, the uh, very first lipid profile. Uh, all the way through all the assays we use today, there are thousands of laboratory tests, including a recent test for uh, troponin, or not for troponin, for um, sepsis called procalcitonin, but also Ken brought in troponins uh, as well. And he's in the process now of setting up uh, LPPLA2 activity test as a test available in his laboratory, and I'm hoping he's going to come down to Baylor and help us there. Uh, as Mary mentioned, you know, previously we've always had to send out the test for the concentration. It's been done at uh, reference laboratories, and it's not automated, so it's all subject to the error of doing it by hand through micropipetting and doing the immunoassay uh, that way. Uh, Ken has over 100 uh, papers uh, in the literature and has won many awards, including the most outstanding speaker by the uh, Clinical Chemistry uh, Association. Uh, he's on the board of directors for the National Academy of Clinic Clinical Biochemistry. And so why don't you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ken Blick, and he's going to uh, present on the validation and the preliminary harmonization of this assay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McAuliffe. Yes, 7 million tests a year. We get about 3,000 samples a day in our laboratory. And I think you heard Dr. McAuliffe say that 70% uh, of medical decision making is based on laboratory data. So we're kind of the foundation, I would have to say, of healthcare. And frankly, uh, that's why they put us in the basement. <laughs> that's a joke, folks. You know, I've got a little love. Uh, uh, challenge here to see who can have the longest title, and as you can see, I have clearly won. But uh, what we're talking about here today is an interesting evaluation of what I think is a very, very exciting laboratory test. And considering that we do a lot of lipid panels in our laboratory and certainly a lot of high sensitivity CRP assays, we're just really excited about the phospholipase A2 activity test. And what we're going to focus on here is some of the lab issues. Uh, when you try to automate an enzymatic test, you have to do a lot of special things because you can have a lot of variation between laboratories. And so we're going to focus on an evaluation of that, and I'm going to share some data with you. And there's a lot of uh, focus in clinical chemistry uh, laboratories to get lab results to be the same, regardless of where you have the test performed. We call that harmonization. You know, making the labs, regardless of where you see the patient, making the lab results match is a very difficult task. And I think you're going to be impressed when you take a look at what we've been able to do with this plaque uh, activity test. Now, we have written a paper and we have an abstract, and I understand that this could be available to you on request. But one of the interesting things here in our abstract is, is we have shown that the normal range of LP uh, LA2 activity ranges from about 84 to 303 nanomoles per, per uh, minute per milliliter. And uh, interestingly enough, about 20% of the patients, 300 subjects included in this study, about 18 to 20% of those people had levels above the cut point that we're using right now for high risk for cardiovascular disease, that number being 225. So there's a lot of people walking around with high risk for coronary vascular diseases. We've heard about it at this conference. 
and a lot of them have essentially normal LDL cholesterol levels. So I think uh, one thing you'll see in our conclusions is that we have a fabulous assay. It's an enzymatic assay. And one of the things is, uh, that I think is very impressive is that we're measuring activity that's involved in the plaque formation process. This inflammatory process that goes on in the intimal area of the artery, ballooning up, making the plaque milieu of uh, cellular debris and other chemicals, and encouraging macrophages to move in and try to clean up that mess, along with smooth muscle cells. This thing keeps enlarging based on the amount of this plaque activity until it thins out the fibrous cap. And then we're able to leak out into the lumen of the blood vessel. We're leaking out some of this thrombogenic material that's forming in here. So I think we can all get a really good picture of how this particular marker really uh, directly relates to the propagation of the disease. Now, I have to show you some chemistry, you know, because uh, I direct the chemistry section. But basically what we're doing here with the oxidized LDL in the intimal area of the artery is we're actually hydrolyzing off this oxidized fatty acid, which turns out to be a pro-inflammatory uh, agent. We also end up with the second product, lysophosphatidylcholine, which is a very pro-inflammatory product as well. So we have these two products showing up in a place where we don't want them in the intimal area of our artery. Not good at all. Now, we've been measuring markers all along uh, for various things. We've talked about it in the lab, high sensitivity CRP for inflammation. We've been measuring uh, lipids for years. I think I measured the first HDL about 30 to 35 years ago. And so we've been measuring these mass uh, measurements of, uh, of LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol for years. But really, we haven't had a good test for plaque stability. You know, we tried myeloperoxidase with minimal success. But now we actually have something that we think mechan mechanistically will tell us what's going on with those patients that have rapidly developing plaque to the extent that it thins out the fibrous cap and sets the patient up for an early infarction. And of course, that's the fear. So here we've got the, uh, got the picture here where we have a thin fibrous cap and then all of these pro-inflammatory markers going on. You saw Dr. McAuliffe's slide where he stained up for plaque activity. It's rich in this area. And then it's no surprise that some of these molecules in here can leak out. As you heard in the talk, we can have platelet adherence uh, to the exposed collagen. We can certainly have release of tissue factor from this material in here. And yes, we even have contact factor and stimulate the intrinsic factor 12. And so it's no surprise we end up with these plaque positive patients with a thrombus. Of course, as opposed to the other kinds of uh, uh, fibrous uh, uh, plaque that we can have here where you have a more s stable uh, and, and thicker plaque. So to, to evaluate this test, uh, we obviously have to think about standardization of the measurements if we're going to get essentially the same values between laboratories. Now to get this done, we have to have a really slick a uh, colorometric substrate that's going to produce a color that virtually every laboratory instrument in the country can measure. And it turns out that we're using paranitrophenol, a synthetic substrate that mimics what I showed you as the chemical reaction for the oxidation, uh, uh, for the uh, hyd hydro hydrolysis of the uh, two molecules that I showed you. So we have a synthetic substrate, but the other thing is we have a recombinant standard uh, in this assay as well to allow us to stabilize this measurement between laboratories. Now I'm going to show you some data that shows you that we have come up with a way to do the, uh, uh, do the kit method in a way where we can get assay precision, great sensitivity, great linearity, specimen stability of course is part of the story, and minimizing the interferences that we can have from endogenous and exo exogenous substances. And moreover, we're going to show you how this, uh, this kit method gives you essentially the same results on 13 different chemistry analyzers 
uh, routinely found in clinical laboratories. We have lab uh, equipment now that can do over 4,000 tests an hour. So automating this assay and having it available on an automated chemistry analyzer is a very uh, big deal indeed. Now, when you take a look at normal range studies, this is a normal range study where we see the data is non-Gaussian. We've looked at uh, percentiles here. This is using a non-parametric approach. What we find here at the low end cutoff of two and a half percentile, uh, the value for both uh, males and females is about 84 uh, nanomoles per minute per ml. On the other hand, when we look at the 97th percentile for both males and females, we can see the upper end cutoff of 303. And so that tends to be kind of the quote unquote reference range or normal range that we use for LP PLA2 activity. Now you'll notice that males tend to run just a little bit higher, but not that much. And a lot of laboratories are just staying with the one reference range. And this particular study was done on 300 patients. Now here's something that's really interesting for people that want to do studies like we've been talking about, is the stability of this activity. Uh, when we store the samples at minus 70, you can see there's virtually no change over a period of months. Now, we don't have a lot of analytes like this in the laboratory, especially enzymes that are stable for a period of 26 months when stored at minus 70 degrees. Even at room temperature, the molecule is pretty stable, uh, as you can see here, up to a month, uh, just pretty much at room temperature. It's, uh, it's more stable when kept in the refrigerator. But uh, I'm impressed with the fact that we're measuring something that's very, very stable, surprisingly stable, when you consider it's an enzyme. The other thing that's neat about this uh, new test that we're talking about here, the plaque activity test, is when we took some plasma pools and serum pools and sent them to different laboratories, and they ran this pool over and over and over and computed the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation the within lab coefficient of variation ran about one to two percent. Now the really neat thing about that is a physician like Dr. McAuliffe, when he sees a change, when he sees a change in value, maybe he's testing a patient over a period of months, when he sees that change he knows it's going on in the patient and not something we're doing in the laboratory. And so when you have a highly reproducible precise method that gives you a CV of one to two percent, that's pretty exciting, and I, I can tell you there are very few enzyme measurements in the laboratory that have that level of precision. Here's a slide that has never been shown probably anywhere for any kind of assay, and I think we need to take note that it's very unusual to take a method like we're talking about and run it on different chemistry analyzers and get essentially the same results Whereas when you plot up the data and do linear regression, you get a slope essentially equal to one. Well, if you compare two, uh, two results on, uh, in this case, 40 samples with a good spread of results, and you get a slope of one, that means you can accept essentially the null hypothesis. There is no difference between doing the method in hospital A with a Abbott architect chemistry analyzer versus uh, perhaps doing it in another hospital on the same patient that's using a COBOS 6000. Essentially, the results are directly comparable. Pretty remarkable when you think about it. 13 different analyzers all giving essentially the same results. Well, what's the secret sauce that allows us to get this done? Well, it turns out it's this recumbent uh, calibrator that we're using, being able to make a calibrator that allows us to standardize the method even when we come up with different reagent lots. Now, as you remember from your freshman chemistry, you can take an absorbance. If you know the molar, molar absorptivity of the thing that's giving you the color, you can compute the concentration from Beer's law without doing a calibrator. Well, you can see if you do that between these two different lots, you get an 18% proportional error when you compare the results with these open circles here. However, if you take these two different lots of reagent 
and you calibrate them using this recombinant DNA calibrator, notice we end up with a regression line slope of essentially one. So this is how we're able to come up with the reproducibility that we're showing you here by using this, uh, this very nice substrate, but also having it calibrated with a recombinant uh, calibrating standard. Here's an interesting plot too because physicians like to add on tests to samples that are already in the laboratory. And uh, this is an example where we've got plotted uh, the plaque 2 activity uh, on a serum sample versus a paired uh, sample collected in uh, EDTA, the kind of specimen we use in the hematology area of the laboratory, doing CBCs and the like. And what we see here is a one, core, a one uh, regression line slope and a correlation of essentially one, meaning that you can add this test on theoretically to an existing sample in the laboratory, uh, be that a serum sample or uh, perhaps an EDTA sample that was collected for a CBC. So that's pretty impressive too, not having to go up and restick the patient. Of course, many of us are thinking that eventually this might be added onto the lipid profile and done along with the other tests that we're doing on our current lipid profile. Here's an interesting study that we did by making up three different lots of reagents and then, then doing what we like to call a linearity study, doing serial dilution. And uh, you'll notice in these three different lots in different laboratories, we were able to come up with a measurable linear range from about 10 uh, nanomoles per uh, minute per milliliter up to about 400. So if you think about it, most of your patients are going to be ranging in around from 80 to maybe 300. So you can, with the cutoff of 225 for high risk. So I think you can see that this assay is going to cover that range quite well. And then we can run these uh, results and get them to you without having to do a dilution. Very exciting. Now we're always worrying about interferences and having things go wrong with our measurements. And so we've done some studies here to show that you can use uh, serum with or without a serum separator gel. You know, our collection tubes have separator gels in them and they can interfere with lab measurement. Well, notice we've checked out serum with and without the separator gel. We've also looked at plasma with and without the separator gel. And notice here we've seen 100% recovery. And again, that slope of one, meaning that you can do these tests on these different kinds of specimens, including in this case, lithium heparin plasma, and you get essentially the same results. So this is pretty phenomenal for lab folks because we don't see many assays that are quite this robust. Now, when you take a look at the things that interfere with our uh, colorometric measurements like we're talking about here, we're usually thinking about an icteric sample, a high bilirubin sample. We're usually thinking about a sample that has hemolysis, has hemoglobin in there, giving it a red color. And then we're thinking about triglycerides. And for endogenous substances like this, you can see that those do not interfere with the activity test. Really nice when you've got an activity test, you're measuring the rate change of color. And so these things tend to interfere in a static way, and uh, they do not interfere with this uh, particular measurement. Pretty impressive. Notice we've tried uh, looking at adding in some uh, exogenous substances that many of the patients getting this test will be taking as drugs. And of course, you can see uh, here we've got a long list. And even at a high level, we did not see any detectable interference. So we've done interference studies, and the assay has turned out to be quite robust in that regard. So I think we can uh, say, based on what we've talked about here, all three speakers, that the plaque test is an exciting test, especially this activity test, using this recombinant uh, calibrator along with the chromogenic substrate, all in a kit method that will run on virtually any automated chemistry analyzer in any hospital lab in the country. And we've seen that some uh, pre-analytical pre processes, like leaving the sample sit around for a while, really doesn't affect the result that we're going to get. A little surprising for an enzyme, you would think that it would affect it, but uh, all of our data shows that this is a very, very stable 
uh, activity uh, on this enzyme. We've noticed too that we can run the assay, uh, saying it again, on different instruments. Very exciting, which I think uh, allows physicians uh, to uh, have more confidence in the assay, especially when they're seeing deltas, seeing changes over baseline one way or the other. They know something is going on in the patient as opposed to something going on, again, as I said, in the laboratory. So um, I think it's an exciting time. It, it's an exciting assay. I think now that we're going to have it available more commonly on automated instruments, we're going to see even more studies that show that uh, this is a unique marker for cardiovascular disease risk. And I think it's going to play a lot of, uh, a big role, I think, in preventing, as this conference is all about, preventing uh, atherosclerosis and, and AMIs in, uh, in folks. So uh, I salute this conference. I think uh, uh, most people that die, die from vascular disease. I think we heard about 50% of some kind of uh, vascular disease. And so, uh, you know, here's a test that can help us identify people that are at risk, especially those that uh, don't have elevations of our more traditional markers like LDL cholesterol. So I think with that, uh, I'll close, and thank you very much.